Statistics. Confidence interval example using T distribution. Get ready and some coffee because it's time to get realistic with statistics. You're not required to, but if you have access to this OneNote file, we're currently in the one. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, uh, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant. Because apparently we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Note presentation section 1946 confidence interval T distribution tab looking at a situation similar to recent presentations, except this time we're focused on the confidence interval and the T distribution as opposed to a normal distribution, which we will discuss more shortly. But first, Quick recap of the general scenario. We're trying to find information about a large population. We can't test every item though within that large population. Therefore, our strategy is that we're gonna take a sample of the population, hoping that we can apply the findings found from the sample to the large population in general, to general techniques that we could use. One, hypothesis testing, two, confidence intervals, Hypothesis testing often lending itself to situations where we think we know what the middle point is, that being the hypothesis. For example, if it says on the bag of peanuts, this is the average amount of peanuts that are in the bag, then we would assume that's basically the middle point. Then we can take a sample and test whether or not that is true. Noting in this situation, we can imagine constructing, say, a curve based on the hypothesis that the number on the bag is the middle point. Then when we run the sample, we're gonna get a number that won't be exactly that because it is a sample. And the question will be, is the result we got far enough away for us to reject the original hypothesis? The other technique is gonna be confidence intervals. That's what we're gonna focus on here, which often lends itself to situations where we don't know what the middle point is. That's what we're trying to find. And therefore, if you're in that situation, when we take the sample and we take the average of the sample, that middle point is basically what we want to make a confidence interval around because we don't have you know, the other hypothesis. Now you could still approach it from a hypothesis standpoint by saying, hey, look, if this is the middle point that I found in the sample, I can imagine multiple hypotheses saying, well, what if the actual number was way over here and I constructed a bell curve over here based on that being my null hypothesis, would the number I actually got be enough for me to reject the original hypothesis? In that case, we can ask that question multiple times uh, and then we would be making a confidence interval from peak to peak basically would be the idea. But it would be easier for us to kind of imagine that whatever result we got from the sample will be the middle point and then I want to construct the curve around the middle point. That would be kind of the easier way to basically visualize things. Now, in certain situations, we might be able to do that with the normal bell shape uh, curve and be able to make a confidence interval based on that information. But sometimes in certain situations, such as, for example, when the uh, our sample is relatively small, then we might have to use these T distributions, which is what we're going to be focusing in on here. Now, the T distributions within Excel, once you get the hang of them, are fairly straightforward because they're similar in nature to what we would do with a normal distribution. But the things we need to keep in mind, of course, is, well, when would we use the T distribution versus a, a normal uh, type of distribution? And then what are the differences? Because the graphs are going to look much the same between a T distribution and a normal distribution. They both have this bell type shape. But with the T distributions, what's gonna happen is the tails of them are gonna be a little bit wider. And that means that more area is gonna be under the wider tails, 
which means that when you're trying to construct a confidence interval, it's going to have to be a bit wider of a confidence interval, which makes sense because if we don't have enough information, you would expect that we would need a wider interval in order to basically give us more confidence. Now also note that the T distributions have multiple basically graphs or shapes of the graphs with wider or thinner tails based on the degrees of freedom calculation, which we will discuss shortly. And so if you were doing this back, you know, like 10 years ago or something like that, you'd have to, you'd have to look up the T distributions and to pick the proper one. But obviously, if you were to do this in Excel, you just have to recognize that you're using T distributions as opposed to the normal distribution. And then based on the input that you give the T distribution, Excel will basically pick the proper curve to be putting in place will be the general idea. All right, we also wanna remember that when would you use the T distributions? So often we're thinking about like a confidence type interval situation. And oftentimes it's in situations where we don't have a lot of data. Remember the general idea would be if we take our, our original data, it may or may not be in a bell shaped type of curve. And if we get enough of that data, then if we imagine every possible combination of samples and take the mean of all those, that data will tend towards a bell-shaped curve in accordance with the central limit theorem is the general idea. But you have to have enough samples in order for it to tend towards that bell-shaped curve. Uh, so if you're in a situation where we don't have a, enough samples, then you're hoping that the actual population data is gonna tend towards like a bell-shaped curve. Many population data do. So if we're talking about the peanut example, then obviously you would think that the error rate would be close to like a bell type of shape, for example. So oftentimes with the T distributions, we're looking at a relatively small uh, sample size and, and hoping that the data itself is gonna be in that uh, bell type uh, shape is gonna be the general idea, okay. Now, if the sample gets large and the population is large, then, then you would think that that T distribution is gonna start to tend towards something similar to uh, the bell-shaped distribution. And there might not be a lot of difference between basically uh, the, the two in that case. Well, we've discussed that in a prior presentation or possibly we'll discuss that later in terms of the shape of the T distribution compared to basically uh, the bell shape. All right. So here's gonna be, now we're gonna imagine like we're, we're in a movie situation and we make the movie, right? So we're gonna be putting the behind the scenes together. We as the reader and the creator know stuff that the people in universe that are in the actual movie, they don't know. So this is the behind the scenes data. So we're gonna say that there's gonna be a population of 500. This is gonna be our information that we will use to construct the actual population which we'll do in Excel in another course or section if you wanna check that out. This is gonna be the input data. So we have the population with a big N, the standard deviation of the population is 300, and then the mean is going to be uh, 2,500. That's gonna be the middle point. So we're using then a data analysis in Excel in order to construct our actual population, which again is what we're drawing from, but in universe, the people don't actually know this information because all they're going to know is basically the sample right so it makes this information now this information you you would think then is going to be basically bell shaped around this 2500 because that's what we told it to do in other words a histogram of this data is 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 not going to be uniform or skewed to the left or skewed to the right you would think it would tend towards a normal distribution with a peak in the middle as many populations do when we're measuring things like heights or things like average error time the errors of a population or something like that now if we were to draw the data from this it's going to come up similar to what we used to create it meaning that the count is 500 that's exactly the same the standard deviation of the population came out to 325 because this was randomly generated. So this is the actual population of the data that was generated for the standard deviation. And the mean, we told it to do it around 2,500 as the middle point. And it, it has a mean, meaning the average of all this of 2,519. So now we're gonna say that's gonna be the actual data, which again, isn't known 
by our end universe, but that's gonna be the information that we know so that we can have a better understanding of what is happening. Now we're gonna take a sample. Note that the sample is relatively small. It's only 10 here. So notice that when we think about the sample size, there's a few things that we wanna remember with our sample size. One, is bigger better? Yeah, usually a bigger sample is better. However, there are limitations. If it goes above a certain point, you might not get a whole lot of added assurance uh, after a certain point. And that's the analogy of the soup. How salty is the soup? We, we only need a teaspoon to test how salty the soup is, whether it's a can of soup or a giant kettle of soup. However, obviously if the sample is, is very small, then that might not be representative just randomly of the population. So, so bigger would be better to some extent. And when you're thinking about the central limit theorem, then we're thinking about if the population data was not in the format of a bell-shaped curve, then the central limit theorem could help us in that if we thought of every combination of samples of whatever sample size that we're going to be using and took the average of all those, that data would tend towards a bell shape according to the central limit theorem. But if our sample size is too small, then possibly that won't be the case, right? And so, and so if our sample size is small, uh, then we might say, hey, look, I'm hoping that this actual data is in a bell shaped curve. And then rather than using the normal distributions, maybe we'll be using the T distributions as we will do here, because that's gonna generate fatter tails on the end, forcing us to have wider confidence intervals, which will give us more confidence given the fact that we have less sample sizes is, is kind of the general idea. Okay, so, so we did the count here and then we did the standard deviation to get that information. All right, so we have the sample size uh, that we that we drawed in here was just 10. So we have 10 on the sample. Du -du -du. And then we have X bar, the mean of the sample. So if I just took the average, adding them up, dividing by 10, we come out to 2,450. Now that's pretty close to the, to, the, to the mean here. Remember when we think about the mean, uh, we can think about the mean of the actual population, which in this case, we're imagining possibly we don't know the mean of the actual population. And then we can think about the mean of the sample, which should tend towards that same central point of the mean of the population. And then we can think about the theoretical mean of all combination of possible samples, in our case of 10, within the sample size, which again should tend towards that same middle point, that same mean number. Now we're imagining that we don't have the standard deviation of the population, which is another characteristic forcing us to possibly use T distributions. If we did know the standard deviation of the population, then we might be able to use just the normal distribution as I believe we've seen in prior presentations. Now with the standard deviation, remember there's a couple things uh, that we wanna keep in mind. And that is there's the standard deviation of the population, which we're imagining we don't know, there's the standard deviation of the sample, which we're imagining will be like the standard deviation, like the sample mean, it should be close to the, the actual population. And then there's the standard deviation of us imagining every combination of 10 uh, samples, which is what, we, what usually tends towards a bell-shaped curve, which is what we've been using. Uh, and that's gonna be a standard error calculation all right and so then we've got the samples number of samples we only have one we're imagining we took one sample out of the population of 500 one sample of 10. so then we've got the standard uh error calculation now that's going to be this formula we're going to drop off uh the second bit i'm just looking at this side which normally was the uh was the sigma over the square root of n and that would be if we knew the standard deviation of the population. We don't know it, but we can approximate it now with the standard deviation of the sample. So now we're gonna take the standard deviation of the sample because that's what we know over the square root of N. N represents the, the count. So if I do that calculation, we come out to this uh, 100 and that's just basically going to be the the standard deviation of the samples 
divided by the square root of 10. And we're taking this standard deviation as opposed to this standard deviation of the population because we're imagining we don't know this number. That's the, that's the, the behind the scenes thing. All right, so then we have uh, alpha. So what we can think about our confidence level. We often pick 95 as the confidence level. So we're gonna make an interval and we're gonna say that we have 95% chance that it's gonna lie within the interval, which means we're imagining if we graph this out, that most of it's gonna be in this middle point, which normally is two standard deviations away, but might be a little bit fatter now because we're using T distributions that have a fatter tail, right? And then, and then that means that 5% is gonna be in those endpoints, which we're gonna call alpha. And then we have the alpha divided by two, which is representing the area under the two endpoints, which is adding up to 5% total. Therefore, each end adds up to five divided by two or 0.025. All right, so then we have the T equals the number of standard uh, deviations in essence. So when we're thinking about the T's, remember that when we look at our curve, in terms of a normal shaped curve, we can basically put on the X axis, the X's, and we can also represent it in what we call Z scores, where the middle point would be zero and the Z's up and to the left and to the right would be measured in terms of standard deviations away. And normally two standard deviations mean that you have about 95% of the data like in the middle. Similar concept, except now we have the T distributions and with the T distributions, we're talking about a curve that's still bell shaped, but the tails are fatter. So when we do the calculation for the T distribution, which could look something like this, that equals T dot inverse, uh, we're going to get the probability and the degrees of freedom. Now the probability we're looking at this one, it's taking one minus the probability because if I just pick that number, uh, uh, then it would be it would come out to basically be negative. So it's one minus that number. And then it's going to be the uh, degrees of freedom, which is going to be then 10, which is the sample size minus uh, the number of samples. That's how you calculate the degrees of freedom. It's simply the sample size minus the number of samples. We only had one sample of 10. And that's going to give us the 2.26. Now, again, you would you would think that if it was a normal distribution and we had 95% confidence and we measured this, we would say, okay, that's going to be the middle point in terms of Z scores, which are now equivalent to like Z, T scores. And then normally if it was Z scores, two Zs on the top and the bottom would represent about 95% of the data in the middle. So now, of course, it's a little bit wider though, because we're thinking about a curve that has fatter tails in it and therefore it's not two t's away it's 2.26 t's away to get that 95 percent confidence interval which makes sense because it's wider which makes sense because we took a small sample which means you would think you'd need a larger interval for the same level of confidence now remember that those t distributions are actually different graphs based on the number based on the degrees of freedom. So if you had a smaller degrees of freedom, you actually have a different graph that's gonna have a different size of tails in it requiring a different range, which Excel is picking up automatically based on the data input of the degrees of freedom. All right, so then our margin of error is going to be, the middle point is going to be, so what's our margin of error? So the margin of error, we got the standard error and so that's going to be our standard error, like our standard deviation for the T distributions now. And then I'm going to say times this 2.2622 gives us about 227. There's rounding involved. So that's going to be what we're going to measure on both sides in terms of X's. So the lower X then we're going to say, well, if the middle point is 2450, and then we're gonna say, here's our margin of error minus the margin of error 227. We get about 2223. And the upper bit of our range is gonna be once again, the middle point. So we'll take the middle point 2450 plus the margin of error 227. That gives us our upper point of 2676. So that's gonna be, that's gonna be then the range uh, that we're coming out with. 
Now, then the question is, is the mean of the actual population within that range? Because we're imagining we don't know that in in universe, but we're saying within 95 percent confidence level, it should be right. Five percent of the time it won't be just by random selection. In this case, the actual population mean is two, five, one, nine. And therefore, it does indeed lie within our range that we calculated. So we can say something like we are 95% sure the population mean is between our range 2,223 and uh, 2,678. So we can imagine like widgets in a bag or something. This is how many widgets are in, how many peanuts are in the bag or whatever is, is the idea. That's going to be the range that we came out with. So, and th we did that with a logic test to see if it was true. So I won't get into that here. If you want to look at the logic test in Excel, We'll do that there. That was a count. That was a, a a formula to get that one. So we'll leave that for now. And let's move on. If we make our graph then. So I'm going to make a graph the way we normally make it with a normal distribution, knowing that we actually use a T distribution and we'll make a graph using T distributions later. But sometimes even if you're using T distributions, you might want to just make a graph with like the normal distribution just so you can visualize the graph. Now, oftentimes I'm not good at drawing it on paper. So, so I'd like to make something in uh, Excel so I can at least visualize it. With the T distributions, as we saw in prior presentations, it's gonna look very similar, except it's gonna have those wider tails on it. So and the problem with the T distributions is it typically wants to make the distribution around the central point at zero. And so you kind of have to get a little bit wonky to make it to make it work. We'll talk about that more later, but we're just going to graph the normal distribution just so you can see that in terms of a picture if you wanted to graph it and, and just to get a pictorial view. So we're going to say the to graph it, I want to get the range of X's that I need. And so I could go four standard deviations on the upper and lower, meaning instead of going 2.26 which is the range that we want to get 95 percent security we're going to go four standard deviations so that we have the full range to graph everything on the graph so standard deviations are 100 times four so that's going to be 400 and i could take that minus the middle point 2450 that gives us about this number right and then i can take 100 times four standard deviations plus the middle point 2450 and that gives us about this number so that's going to be the range on our graph in terms of x's and then i made it i made it i hard coded it over here and then we can graph that and again i'm doing this in terms of not t's but normal distribution just so we recognize what's happened just so we can kind of recognize the same idea in normal distributions this is a sequence calculation we started at the low point in this case here because it keeps changing whenever I click on the number. So I picked it from here so it doesn't change. And then we said this, mi this minus this plus one. And then the number of columns is one. We start at the lower number and we go up one at a time. And then we did the P of X, which again should be T distributions, but I just did the normal distribution here. We'll talk about graphing the T distribution later. We did a little bit on that in the past. So this is not exactly the same thing, remember, but we're just mirroring it in the normal distributions to get an idea. Norm.dist, X is gonna be these X's. The, the mean is gonna be the middle point that we got over here. Here's the mean. And then we've got the standard deviation, which is typically the standard error that we're gonna be picking up. And then we have, it's going to be uh, not cumulative, therefore zero calculating uh, those and then we've got the uh, the Z now this again the Z not the T the T and the Z are kind of like the same thing except with a normal distribution we would be using Z's and with the T distributions we'd be using T's those are the two ways you can represent the X axis down here we're just calculating these by taking the this minus well let's just calculate one of them we would take each of the X's two one four eight and then we're going to say minus the middle point minus the middle point of two four five oh which is right there and then divide that by the standard 
error divided by the standard error, in this case of 100, and that gives us the 3.02 in this case, and then we did that all the way down, measuring it in standard deviations, and then this is giving us that middle point. If we wanna have two axes down here, measuring it both in Xs and in Zs, which are similar to the Ts in our case, then then you have to have two graphs that you can apply that to in Excel. We'll do that in Excel if you wanna check that out in another course or section, and then we can add a secondary axis. So then if we're, if we're so, the, so the general idea here would be then that because we're looking at confidence intervals, we, we took the, the middle, the average, that 2,400, and we're basically going to assume that that's the middle point because we're imagining we don't know what the middle point is. So we can't do the hypothesis testing. So we're going to imagine that is the middle point. Then we have to construct then our interval around that middle point. We could do that with hypothesis testing by basically imagining every point around it as though that was the hypothesized mean and then build a bell curve around each of those to see if the actual result we got was far enough away to reject it, in which case we would have a peak to peak would be our interval. But it's easier to think about this as the middle point and then construct our curve around it and make our interval the way we would normally kind of think of it. So we're, that's in essence what we're gonna do. Then the question is, can I use my normal distribution or do I have to use a T distribution? Well, if I have the standard deviation, I might be able to just simply, of the population, I might be able to use still the, nor, the normal distribution. But if I don't have the standard deviation, and in particular, if the sample I have is relatively small, and then I might have to use the T distribution, which has fatter tails on it, requiring us to have a larger range to get the same amount in the middle which would normally be like 95%, which would normally be two standard deviations. We then measure this, we can measure this in terms of X's, distance from here to here, the middle point, the range in X's, and hopefully this range that was based on our sample will actually contain the, the actual amount, which in practice we don't really know because we don't know what it is, but in our case, we made the population first and we saw that it did indeed fall there in between. However, even with just random error, it would not 5% of the time because we did we ran a 95% confidence level, which isn't always required. You could do a 99% confidence level, in which case the range would be larger. Uh, and then we can also measure it in Z scores, which in the case of T distributions would be T uh, T scores, and that would be measuring the same distance in terms of how many standard deviations, in our case, standard errors, standard deviations away from the middle point, middle point then being zero, negative going this way, positive going to the right. So again, remember that this graph was made just with a normal distributions, therefore we don't have the slightly fatter tails over here, but you can still kind of do that because you can easily make the middle point, it's all the same, just to kind of visualize pictorially, remembering that you could still make the two axes in X's, and then this one would be in Z's here, but that's kind of like equivalent to what you're envisioning in X's or in T distributions. So we'll talk more about the T distributions and maybe how we can graph those uh, in, future, in a future presentation.